How are we? Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Physics Live. This is fantastic. A beautiful spare room uh, because we're all currently um, at home more than usual. Um, but welcome. I'm so happy hundreds of you have actually joined us this morning. Um, so it's wonderful to be with you. Um, my name's Lisa, Lisa Harvey Smith. I am um, an astrophysicist, so I'm the live astrophysicist. Um, I'm an author, I've written books, uh, and I'm going to be sharing one of them with you today under the stars. And I am very, very excited to be producing these three fantastic live events because a lot of us, of course, um, are working from home more than usual or studying from home. And that's a great thing because we can connect via the internet um, and we can talk across Australia about fantastic things like science. So I hope you're going to really enjoy that. I'm looking forward to it too. Um, now we have three of these events. Um, two coming up will be about the moon um, next month, May the 6th. We're around full be doing an evening event so we can talk about the earth the moon how to observe the stars as well and we'll be finding out how to use um, an app on your smartphone so that you can actually look at the sky and see what you're looking at find planets and stars and galaxies and all sorts of fun things then the next one we'll be looking at deep space um, and all the things out there like the stars and the galaxies and that's going to be a lot of fun but today we're going to focus on the science of the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere in particular, the layer of air that goes right around the globe, around the whole Earth, and that allows us to live. So it's a really important thing. It's going to be really fun. Now, um, at the end of each session, we're going to have a and a so there'll be an opportunity to ask any questions about space, anything about our universe at all, and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can as well. Um, but the way that we're going to do that is because, obviously, I'm not in a room with you. I'm on the screen. Um, you can see that I can't see you. So we're going to do a Q&A through something called Slido. And this is a way to talk to each other through keyboards. So what you do is, if you haven't already, go on to another tab on your computer or if you have a smartphone or a tablet, um, open up a web browser and you type in www slido.com that's s l i d o.com and when you go onto that web page um, you will find um, first uh, it asks you for a code and to log in so we have a nice secure chat room um, the code is u capital u 242 so you type that in u242 um, click the little green arrow on the right hand side and that should let you into the chat room and then we will have all the questions coming up. I'll be able to see them in real time. And then we'll be able to have a chat all together. Sounds good, doesn't it? All right. So if you go to slido.com, get ready, type in U242, green arrow, you should be able to chat with me. Um, and that will all be good fun. So let's check that Slido is working, first of all. So if you log in there now, um, and then you will have a box that says type question. So you can actually add the question on the top there. And the first question is, where are you joining us from today? So where in Australia are you? So let's check this, this works. Um, and you can type in your town or city or community and your state, and then you can put your name underneath if you'd like to. So um, I'm gonna put, um, okay, da, 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 answer, name, send and you can send me your answers. So, where are you joining us from today? So we have lots of people who are called anonymous because that's because you forgot to put your name in, but we have Ari in Darwin. Hi, Ari. Good to see you, Evelyn in, well, we don't know where you are. I've just got hello, hello, very nice. Um, in Sydney, very nice. Hi, Lisa, we're in Earlwood. Hi, Evie and Will, nice to see you. Greenwich, Sydney, we've got Melbourne, Darwin, Sydney, Perth. Lots of people getting up early in Perth, I appreciate that, thank you. Bundaberg, um, we have Sydney, Darwin. Oh, Aidan loved my book. Thank you, Aidan, that's very nice. We've got Cairns, Adelaide, New South Wales, uh, Glenmore Park, Nimbin, Marrickville. There are so many people. Um, so that's fantastic. So that means Slido's working, so we can all chat to each other, which is really, really good. 
So today I wanted to talk about science and in particular the Earth's atmosphere because as an astronomer I look up at the stars and of course the Earth's atmosphere is in the way. Sometimes it's cloudy, of course, and we can't see the stars at all. But the Earth's atmosphere is fascinating in its own right. I think you know, it's an amazing, interesting thing. And people who study the um, Earth's atmosphere and, and the weather um, called meteorologists, they do some fantastic stuff and they help to uh, figure out what the weather is going to be like for us as well. So have we ever thought about the atmosphere? What, what's it made of? And, and, and really, you know, where do, how, how high does it go? All these interesting questions. Because people you didn't really used to know about the air and what it was made of. You can feel the air sometimes. When it's windy, you can feel the air touching your face um, or blowing your hair or sometimes knocking trees over if it's very windy. You can sometimes feel the air if it's very hot or very cold, but normally we don't even notice it. If you move your hand through the air, you don't really notice the air, do you? Because it's very, very light and very airy, you could say. So this amazing stuff is all around us. Um, and it goes very, very high up above our head as well. Um, so I wanted to just get a think about it for a little bit. So we breathe in the atmosphere as well, don't we? Breathe in, breathe out, very nice. So we breathe in the atmosphere and it gives us life. It gives us life and it enables us um, to live here on planet Earth. Many planets don't have an atmosphere, such as Pluto has a very thin atmosphere um, and it wouldn't be suitable for living there. So we're very lucky we have a very tall atmosphere. If we walk up a hill, we can still breathe at the top of the hill. So the atmosphere gets a little bit thinner but we can barely notice it at all. I bet some of you like climbing mountains. I like climbing up mountains. And if you've ever thought about climbing the highest mountain in the whole world, Mount Everest, you ever thought about that? maybe climbing the highest mountain? Now that's amazingly tall. And up there, often climbers need oxygen because it's so high up and the air gets thinner as you go up and up and up. And you actually need to use oxygen um, and to breathe special oxygen tanks when you go up Mount Everest. So that's a really, really high up place. And even higher than Mount Everest, above all the aeroplanes and at that height, there's no air at all. Once you get about 100 kilometers above the ground level, there is no air at all. And that is officially the boundary of space. And it's an amazing place because space in, in outer space is basically a vacuum. There's no air at all. Even higher than that, about 400 kilometers above our heads, are currently orbiting a small team of astronauts in the International Space Station. And sometimes you can see them flying over and you can give them a little wave. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? So let's think about the air now. What is it made of? So what do we breathe in and breathe out? What's the air made of? And that's going to be our first question on Slido. Okay, so get on slido.com. U242 is the code, and I'm going to ask you now, what is the air made of? What chemicals or what gases are in the air? And there's lots of them, so there's lots of right answers. That's your challenge. Go. If you can think of any of the gases in the air, there's a little bit of a clue. Breathing in, breathing out. What do we breathe in and out? There's so many questions. I'm just going to slide it down. Okay, we've got some answers coming in. Excellent. We've got Leila and Co saying CO2, carbon dioxide. Very good. That is definitely in the air. Somebody saying Ruth and Henry, Lachlan and Kaylee saying oxygen. That's a good answer. That's the one we breathe in and out, isn't it? That use that we use in our muscles. Um, and we use that to power our bodies. Lots of people say gas. That's very good. Yes, the air is made of gas. Very good. And those chemicals inside the air oxygen, CO2. Some people are saying atoms. That's also a very good answer. Um, some of them are saying uh, nitrogen, oxygen. So those are two of the main gases. Um, hydrogen. We've got other gases there. Very good. Excellent. We've got somebody saying carbon, helium as well. Those are definitely ones. Nitrogen. Someone's shouting. Very, very good. So we've got lots of gases here. Oxygen, hydrogen, water molecules. That's a great one. We'll talk about water in the atmosphere later. That's a very good one. 
Okay, excellent. So lots of fantastic answers coming in here on Slido. Um, and we have fantastic hundreds and hundreds of people saying oxygen because that's a very important one. So saying nitrous oxide, which is not a good gas to breathe in. So the atmosphere is actually made of 78%. So that's more than three quarters of the atmosphere is made of nitrogen. And when we breathe that into our bodies, we just breathe it back out again. We don't use it in our bodies when we when we breathe it. But the oxygen is about 21 percent, uh, just under a quarter of the air is made of oxygen gas. Um, and that's a very important gas for us because we use it as a fuel in our bodies. Uh, and that's a wonderful fuel because um, we actually have it all around us. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, the third gas that is the third most um, populous gas in our atmosphere is actually argon. I bet you didn't know that, argon. I don't think anyone said argon, unless I'm, I've missed it. But that's actually an inert gas that doesn't do anything. It just kind of sits there, gets breathed in, gets breathed out, and nothing really happens. Now nitrogen is used in, in plants and lots of important uses for nitrogen in nature, but argon is one of these gases that um, really doesn't do much. The fourth gas, the fourth um, biggest gas in our atmosphere is CO2. And lots of people mention that on carbon dioxide. And that's the gas um, that we release when we burn things like coal and oil. Um, and that amount of CO2 is increasing in our atmosphere, which is causing um, problems with the, the atmosphere and, and, and warming of the earth. So it's very, very interesting to study the atmosphere. Other gases, are neon, um, helium, methane. Helium's a funny one, isn't it? When you breathe it in in a balloon. <laughs> Um, we've got krypton, hydrogen, and then lots and lots of other gases, but mainly we're just nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and argon in our atmosphere. So there we go. Let's hope you've learned something already. Fantastic. So the air is also made of tiny particles. Now these particles make up these things like oxygen and hydrogen and, ne and neon and all these other, these other gases, um, but they're called atoms. And molecules, so atoms, that was very good, that was a very good answer, because these atoms um, join together to form molecules of nitrogen and molecules of um, oxygen and these other gases. So that's what the atmosphere is made of, tiny, tiny little particles. So that's great, we've learned something already, we've had a chat about the air, um, and really this takes us to the next thing which is thinking about the atmosphere as a whole and how these little tiny particles, these little atoms and molecules actually make up the air and how they affect how we see the air. Now, I've got a window in this room, it's just over there, and I'm looking out the window now and I can see colours in the sky. I'm not going to tell you what those colours are because I want to ask you to look out the window now in your room, wherever you're sitting, and tell me what colour you can see in the sky. It might be more than one colour. So I'd like you to go on Slido now and tell me about the colours in the sky that you can see. All right, go. Let's see who gets in first. Is it a sunny day where you are? Maybe you want to put where you are as well in the answer so we can tell what the weather's like. Alison Harrison got in first. Well done. Uh, Grey and white. That sounds quite much longer. Um, somebody saying light blue. Interesting, you're in a sunny place. That's Jaya. Ella, age seven, saying blue and white. That's fantastic. So I guess your sky is blue and there's a few white fluffy clouds where you are. Somebody has said red, George Alder. Now I reckon you might be in WA because it might be early morning there. And it might be just getting a little bit light red in that colour. Blue and white, lots of people have got clouds. Lovely, Dylan, you've got a lovely blue sky, fantastic. Okay, so we've got lots and lots of blue. Um, nobody's given me any silly answers yet, like purple. That's very, very good. You're very nice people. Um, fantastic, white and blue. Henry and Lucy Barker. And Lachlan and Kaylee as well, same white and blue. So it looks like we've got some fantastic weather across Australia today. Um, but have you ever thought about why the sky is blue? Have you ever thought about that? I think that's really interesting. Um, so I want to actually read you a story. 
about why the sky is blue from Under the Stars, Astrophysics for Bedtime. So this book is lots of short stories about, now the book was illustrated by somebody called Mel Matthews, a fantastic illustrator. She draws pictures um, and here is a wonderful picture. I can just make sure you can see that. Um, and that goes with the story and hopefully it will make sense in just a moment. So sit comfortably, relax, breathe in, breathe out, all that oxygen, nitrogen, argon, CO2, all those other chemicals going into your body and fueling your brain. So why is the sky blue? The light from our nearest star, which is called the sun, constantly floods the earth. This intense glow comes from the unimaginably hot middle of our temperature of 15 million degrees. Since the earth is round, the sun shines steadily over half of our world at any one time. So when the sun is in the sky above one half of the planet, it's daytime there, while the other half sleeps in darkness. The sun is on average 150 million kilometers from the earth. That's a long way. Now sunlight travels all that way through deep space to reach us. Each beam of light takes eight minutes to complete this incredible journey. When the light reaches the earth, it first passes through our atmosphere, a thick layer of air that reaches more than 80 kilometers into the sky. This atmosphere acts as a protective blanket for our planet. It keeps us warm. It stops space rocks from hitting our heads. And of course, it provides the air that we need to breathe in order to stay alive. Our atmosphere is made of molecules, the tiny microscopic building blocks of, well, everything. Many of the molecules in our atmosphere are made of chemicals like nitrogen and oxygen. Since the light waves are very, very small, they bounce off these molecules. The air molecules act like millions of tiny mirrors reflecting this light. Sunlight is made up of all the colors of the rainbow. You can see those hidden colors if you let sunshine, um, sunlight shine through a crystal or a prism. If you're lucky, you'll see tiny rainbows sprinkled right across the room. The way in which sunlight bounces off molecules of air depends on the color of light. Red light waves are stretched out so that when they interact with these little tiny molecule mirrors, the red colors are hardly scattered at all. But blue colors, blue light travels in a very different way. They move in tight bundles. So they bounce off molecules randomly and scatter in all directions. That's why our sky is blue. Not all planets have blue skies. The color of the sky depends on the makeup of the atmosphere. On the moon, the sky is black. That's right, even during the daytime. That's because there is no atmosphere on the moon. There are no tiny mirrors to reflect the light. The sky on Mars is very different again. What color is it? It's red, that's right. That's because Mars has a very thin atmosphere compared with the Earth's and hardly any molecules are in the atmosphere. There are hardly any tiny mirrors, so there's very little scattered light. And there's another thing, Mars also has a lot of red dust in its sky. So if you're standing on the surface of the planet, it would seem like you're in the middle of a huge dust storm most of the time. And this dust absorbs blue light better than it absorbs red light. So I think light and color are amazing. Next time you look up at a beautiful blue sky, think about the incredible journey that this light has taken from the sun. So that is beautiful about those tiny little molecules, those tiny pieces of oxygen and nitrogen 
and carbon dioxide acting as little tiny mirrors. And that's why this illustration is so nice. We can see all those little mirrors in the atmosphere and they are scattering the blue light from the sun. And all that light scatters right across the sky. And here we see it again, that cascade. So now you know why the sky is blue. I reckon you can tell mum and dad, you'd seem smarter than them. It's a good idea. So I think we're really lucky to have a blue sky, don't you? Can you imagine living on the moon and the sky's blue even during the day? Imagine you're sunbathing with a little drink of lemonade on a sunbed and the sky's completely black and the stars are out. I think that would be really strange. Now, sometimes you see other colours in the sky, don't you? I mean, we talked on Slido there about the colour of the sky and some people were saying a little bit red. But sometimes at sunrise and sunset, or if it's very dusty or smoky, it can be quite a red sky, can't it? because those pieces of smoke or dust in the air can reflect the light differently. So sometimes it's a different color. That's very interesting how that happens. Now, other times the sky might be dark, like at nighttime, because the sun is on the other side of the earth, the backside, and then there is no light scattering it across the sky. So I think we're pretty lucky to have a beautiful blue sky, don't you? Now, we're going to move on to a different type of colour in the sky. Now, this is a little bit rarer. It doesn't happen very often. But sometimes it's cloudy and sunny at the same time. And sometimes it's a bit rainy and sunny at the same time. And sometimes you'll see some cool colours in the sky. And I want you to think about when you can see some really cool colours in the sky. What's that called? when it's a bit cloudy and a bit rainy and a bit sunny at the same time. So I want you to go onto Slido again and tell me what that amazing light show is called in those circumstances where you can see lots of colours in a big arch across the sky. Who's going to win today? Who's going to win this one? Okay, what's this called? When there's lots of colours in the sky. Here we go. Scrolling down. We are getting some answers in, very good. I think everyone knows the answer to this. Ruth and Henry, you're the winners. Rainbow, fantastic. I like that one. Ella, very good. You're very quick, aren't you? Rainbow, Abby says rainbow. Evie says rainbow. Very good, everyone. Um, everyone knows it's a rainbow. We've got the phrases rainbow, exclamation mark. So I think rainbows are really cool. We can see them in the sky um, sometimes when it's a bit cloudy and a bit sunny at the same time and maybe it's raining a little bit and that rain is sprinkling down and the sunlight is coming from the, the sun and going through the water droplets so let's find out more about rainbows now again we're going to read from under the stars and this chapter is called rainbows nature's light show and this child is looking at the rainbow and is very happy with it <laughs> she looks very happy doesn't she Okay, so let's read about rainbows and learn a little bit more about them. So I'll ask you a question, have you ever seen a rainbow? Have you? Yeah. Has anyone not seen a rainbow? I hope you will see one soon because we're getting into autumn and I think it would be a bit more rainy. Have you ever seen a rainbow? I'll bet you have. These giant arches of light are amazing. They are nature's beautiful light show. Rainbows reach across the sky as far as you can see. Their glowing light is separated into thin bands of colour. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Rainbows are very special because we don't see them very often. They only happen when it's sunny and raining at the same time. Imagine there's a bright and glorious day. There's no clouds in the sky at all. There's no rainbows here. You need rain to make a rainbow. Now imagine the rain comes, the weather changes, and a few ducks. A short shower begins. Between the clouds, a sunny spell dries everything up. Now this is more like it. 
These are prime viewing conditions for rainbows. So how is a rainbow formed? A rainbow appears when sunshine bounces off raindrops. Boing, boing, boing. The sunlight shines on the front of a raindrop, travels all the way through the water, bounces off the back of the raindrop like a mirror, and then the light goes back out the front of the raindrop towards your eye. As the light from the sun passes through the raindrop, it gets spread out into many different colours. That's because some colours of light are bent more than others as they travel through. Violet light is bent the most. So we see violet on the inside of the rainbow. Red light is bent the least. So we see this on the outside of the rainbow. We end up seeing a giant arc of light layered in its amazing colours from violet to red. We only ever see rainbows directly opposite to the sun. The line between you and the sun, so if you and a friend are standing side by side and you look at a rainbow, you're seeing two completely separate rainbows. You're looking at separate raindrops. Rainbows are most common in the morning and in the evening because this is when the sun is low in the sky. That means the rainbow will be high in the sky because there's a straight line between you, the sun and the rainbow. We also see rainbows in other places. Now, have you ever turned on a hose on a sunny day? You can sometimes see the colors of the rainbow in the fine mist of water. And when you visit a waterfall, Sometimes you might be lucky enough to see a small rainbow in the water spraying into the air. We can even see rainbows around the moon. On a very cold night, crystals of ice hang in the air high up in the Earth's atmosphere. These crystals reflect the light, creating a faint rainbow all the way around the moon. We call these moonbows or halos. So next time you see a rainbow, just imagine how the sunlight is bouncing off millions of tiny raindrops and spreading out into its magnificent colours. Very nice. So next time you see a rainbow, and that might even be today for you cloudy grey people, um, let's hope that you can think about those tiny little light drops. Fantastic. So now we've got time for some questions. We've talked about the atmosphere, we've talked about molecules and atoms, um, we've talked about why the sky is blue and how the light from the sun scatters off the tiny molecules and the tiny little particles, blue skies and also rainbows. But we can also talk about space too. So it's your turn now to ask me any questions on slido.com. Um, with the code U242, and you can log in. I see hundreds of you logged in right now, um, and we are getting some fantastic, fantastic questions in, and I'm going to spend as much time as I can answering these questions, um, and then we will go from there. So I'm getting some questions in here. Okay. Can Willow, okay, Willow. Hi, Willow. Can rainbows appear without water? That's a really great question. We don't really think rainbows can appear without water in our atmosphere. But if you were spraying of liquid into the air, I don't know, um, any liquid really, and you had clouds, like other planets have clouds of methane, they have clouds of different chemicals. Um, and if some of those were in liquid form and you had droplets of those liquids in the atmosphere, you could actually potentially get rainbows um, from those different liquids. But in the Earth's atmosphere, we only have really water in liquid form. So we only see water rainbows. Um, but theoretically, if you did spray a different liquid into the atmosphere, you could maybe get rainbows too. Um, and they would have a different size to the ones in water. That's a really, really good question. Excellent. Uh, Ethan, this is a funny one. I love it. Box area in your, the, the little tubes inside your throat. Um, and 
also the thickness of the the air how light the air is inside so when you breathe in helium and you shouldn't do that actually it's a, it's a dangerous thing to do but you sometimes people have done it and get a high voice now um that is interesting because it's because of the the density of the air inside so if you have a deeper voice um if you get rid of the helium you could have a deeper voice but the amount of helium in our atmosphere is actually really really low um so it's probably not going to make much of a difference um, but it's a really great question i like that one okay how are the aurora colors formed um that's a really really good one um kieran grace yeah so how does the aurora form this is fantastic so the aurora is the northern or southern lights so in australia you would see the southern lights and that means this beautiful at night curtains of purple and green light and red light too now this is formed when the sun does a burp and all this gas comes out really hot gas um, and it comes out because magnetic fields in the sun are throwing these charged particles out you want the technical terms for it but that means all this hot gas flies out across space towards the earth and when it hits our atmosphere um, it hits the oxygen um, and the nitrogen and the other gases in our atmosphere um, and it causes those to gain energy um, and then when they lose energy again they, they emit this light it's red and green light and it's amazing you get this bits of the sun flying out hitting our atmosphere and shaking uh, and energizing the oxygen in our atmosphere and nitrogen and creating these beautiful light shows. So that's a really, really good question and something I hope you will see one day because it's a very beautiful thing. I've only seen it once um, and I've been looking at the sky for a very long time. So that's a, a fantastic thing to look out for. Okay, uh, we have Ella. Ella, you've answered some fantastic questions today, seven years old Ella. Have scientists seen the unseen planet Neptune? Well, we have seen Neptune, actually. Um, it was discovered in the 18th century, that's um, quite a long time ago now, more than 200 years ago, um, using uh, a telescope. So Neptune was first seen with a telescope. It's too far away and too faint to see just with our eyes. We have to use a big telescope to see it. So yes, scientists have seen it. We've also sent spacecraft all the way to Neptune, which is in the far areas of the, the outer atmosphere of, of the solar system. And um, it's a beautiful blue planet. It has a great white spot. It has thin rings. Um, and in fact, there's a chapter in the book if you wanna have a read of that. Um, but that's a, it's a beautiful planet, um, very cold and very windy. Uh, Leila and co are asking, will you explain why the sun is yellow? That's a good one. Um, so the sun is yellow because it's glowing very hot. It's 15 million degrees in the center. There's something called nuclear fusion going on, which is burning hot, hot, hot burning um, by hydrogen atoms sort of squishing together and forming helium. That makes um, light and energy and heat and lots and lots of and then that heat travels out to the outside of the sun. Um, and this causes um, light to emit, basically. It just causes, that temperature causes light. Um, the surface temperature of the sun is about 5,800 degrees. Um, that's very, very hot. Uh, although it's 15 million degrees in the middle, it's only less than 6,000 degrees on the surface. And that emits a kind of a, a yellowy color. If the sun was hotter, it would emit a kind of whitey blue color. So the blue stars are the hottest stars. And if it was cooler, about 3,000, 4,000 degrees, it would be red. So the temperature um, tells us what color the star is or the, the, the color tells us what temperature the star is. So that's really, really um, useful tool actually for us to understand more about the stars. Okay, here is um, a good question about um, Robbie. How do we know what the Milky Way looks like if we've never been outside to look at it? So, Robbie, the Milky Way. The Milky Way is delicious chocolate. But also, it is our galaxy that we live in, which is another delicious chocolate. But anyway, I'm hungry. Um, but the beautiful galaxy that we see in the night sky, when we look up at the sky, we see this beautiful band of light. 
and we see some other stars too. But this band of light where there are, there are more stars is called the Milky Way. And we live inside this huge city of stars. There's 200 million of them, uh, sorry, 200 billion of them. And this is called the Milky Way, this giant star city where we live. And it's a bit like a city on the earth. There's lots and lots of people, lots of lights. And um, it's a very busy place. The Milky Way is where we live in, in our galaxy. Um, now we know what it looks like because we can count the stars in each direction and we can see how far away they are. And then we can build up a kind of a model in our heads. And, and um, the first time that was done was hundreds of years ago. And um, we figured out that it looks like a sort of a flat pancake um, with a little blob in the middle and then spiral arms. Um, and it looks fantastic actually. It looks a little bit like an octopus. Um, and I'll try and find a picture <laughs> of that octopus. Um, but I think we have um, a really, a really beautiful galaxy where we live, and um, we know what it looks like because we can count the stars, and we can also see what other galaxies look like, and they also look like wonderful big octopuses. Um, so, <laughs> so that's that's how we know. I'm just trying to find this wonderful picture um, that shows us. Here we go. This is a bit what our galaxy looks like. A bit like a beautiful octopus with billions of stars in the shape of a spiral. And this is drawn a bit like an octopus too. Okay, fantastic. Next questions we're going for. Okay. Annabelle and Pippa say, do the whole of Australia see the rainbows? Yes, luckily any, any, anyone can see a rainbow. All you have to do is time when it's raining and sunny at the same time. And you get the sun behind you and you'll see a rainbow completely opposite the sun. So get the sun behind you and you'll be able to see a rainbow. And if it's never raining where you live, because it doesn't rain some places in Australia, um, if you're allowed to use a hose pipe, get a grown up to help you um, and spray the hose with your finger over the end. You can make a little, little spray of water in the sky and then you can see a rainbow of your own. Just get the sun behind you and you can make your own rainbow. Sarah and Beth are asking, why can't we see the stars during the daytime? Well, it's a really good question. The answer is, it's just because our eyes aren't very good at seeing bright things and dark things at the same time. The stars are there during the daytime. They're, if you look up in the sky now, that imagine all the stars, because they're, they're really there. But the sunlight is very bright and it's scattering off the little molecules, the little mirrors in the air. And that's creating a lot of light. And our eyes kind of aren't very good at seeing bright things and dark things at the same time. So if we had better eyes, we'd actually be able to see the stars. But our eyes are tuned for the daytime. So that's why we can't see the stars during the day. Okay, excellent. Uh, what colour are the stars? So, yeah, another good question about the stars. So they go from brown dwarfs, which are genuinely like, purpley browny color, and we can't really see many of these um, because they're very very faint all the way through red and blue and yellow and orange and white but we never see green stars and that's an interesting question why because green is in the middle of the rainbow and no stars emit only one color they emit colors it's just where they emit the most light where they're brightest that's the color that they appear so if you have a green star in the middle of the rainbow, it actually emits all the colours of the rainbow. So it appears white. So a white star is actually a green star. How strange. Um, so Charlie's asking, why can no one hear you scream in space? Well, that's a great one because space is a vacuum or almost a vacuum. It's totally empty um, and sound is actually the movement of air particles, so molecules of air. So when you make a sound, you're actually moving the air and that air is squishing up and then stretching and squishing up and stretching and that sound goes into your ear and then your ear makes cleverness and then that goes to your brain and says, I can hear this. So that's the technical way of describing it. And really it's just the squishing and stretching of air molecules. Um, so that's why in space there's no air, no one can hear you scream. There's no need to scream in space anyway. Uh, why are the planets different colours from Gloria aged five? 
Okay, good one. So why are the planets different colors? Well, it depends what gases um, and chemicals are in their atmospheres. So Mars is red because it has red dust, has a lot of iron in the soil. Um, then the Earth looks blue because it has a lot of ocean uh, and our atmosphere is blue too. Now, the other planets have lots of different colors like Jupiter is stripy and it's kind of brown, white colors uh, and orange, yellow colors. And those colors come from the different um, molecules or the different gases. So it has a lot of methane um, and that, that gives you this kind of orangey, greeny colors. So it depends what types of chemicals are in the sky in those different planets. And that's what gives it the color. Um, okay. We'll do one or two more questions and then we'll have to go and we can do an amazing full moon. Um, party next time. What's the biggest star in the Milky Way, says Maddie. Wow. Well, there is an amazing star called Eta Carina. Um, some people call it Eta Carinae. I don't. I call it Eta Carina. But um, it is enormous. Um, there's probably bigger ones, but this one is about to explode. So it's absolutely gigantic. There are stars um, tens of thousands of times brighter than the sun. And these stars are very unstable. Um, they started their life very, very big, They're very hot and bright, um, thousands and tens of thousands of times brighter than the sun. Um, they live very quickly. Um, our sun has already lived six, well, five billion years or so. It will live another five billion years. Um, but these stars only live for a few millions of years, which isn't very long in terms of stars. So these big, big stars end their lives as a supernova. They explode and they belch all their stuff into space, all their gas and all their guts go bleh into space and make a big mess. And uh, Isa Carina is one of these stars. It's one of the biggest in our Milky Way. What colour would the sky be on Saturn? Emilia. Now, Saturn is a very gassy planet. It's very gassy. Um, it's actually kind of yellow. Um, but if you were inside the atmosphere of Saturn, it would be very foggy. You'd kind of see a foggy yellow colour. Um, there's actually no surface on Saturn, so it just gets denser and denser and denser as you get down through the atmosphere, and then you kind of have a liquid core. We don't know if there's a solid bit in the middle, but it's not like the Earth where you have a solid crust made of rocks and we live on the, live on the surface. And there's soil and trees and plants. It's not like that on Saturn. So it's a beautiful big planet made of gas, um, and it has a huge system of rings made of lots of little rocks. Um, it's a beautiful place, um, but very much unlike the Earth. Okay, one, one or two more questions. Um, how do the planets get their names? That's a good one. Well, they actually come, um, of course, we call them certain things, but other cultures call them different things. So they have different names in different languages. Um, but the, the, the names that we call them in the English language um, actually caught, come from the Roman, um, so the Italian um, language, the ancient Italian language. So that that's um, where the names come from for the planets. Um, but as I say, they're called different things in, in different languages. So um, we will have one more question. Let's get down to the bottom here. Uh, okay, this is a nice one to finish off with. Um, what is your favorite planet? <sighs> I want you to have a think about that. What's your favorite planet? What's your favorite planet? Type, type it in Slido. Tell me what your favorite planet is. Because I think, well, there's eight planets. There's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And of course, this one used to be a planet, Pluto, but it's not a planet anymore, but it is loved because it has all its moons with it. So that's nice. So I think my favorite planet would have to be Earth because it has a lovely temperature, has beautiful oceans. It has an atmosphere we can breathe, but I'd like to see what you Lots of people are saying Earth. Someone's saying Saturn. Saturn is incredibly beautiful. So if you look at Saturn through a small telescope or even a pair of binoculars, you can see 
the little tiny rings. It's a very beautiful. <laughs> Somebody, Amalia, I do know you, Amalia. You're saying Kepler 62e. Very good. Um, that's a planet around a different star. I didn't actually specify which planet in our solar system, so that's very good. Um, okay, good. So a lot of you like Earth. Um, Elise likes Jupiter. Edward likes Uranus. Amelia is saying Saturn, exclamation marks. So that's very good. So I can see you're big planet fans, which is fantastic. Um, look, I've had a lot of fun today. Um, we've learned a lot about our sky, our atmosphere, the atoms, the molecules, the colors, um, and the sun. Um, we've talked about the temperatures of the stars. We've talked about our galaxy. Um, and I know we're going to have a lot of fun in the next sessions too. I'm afraid that's it is all we've got time for, um, but don't miss the next session where we'll be doing a session in the evening, um, 6.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Time, that's Sydney, Melbourne time. Um, we will be looking at the full moon and I'll be teaching you how to use your smartphone or tablet to download a free app that helps you understand what's up there in the sky. So you can actually hold your app up to the sky and it shows you what stars are in front of your eyes. So we can use that to, to look at the International Space Station, the constellations, things like Orion and the Southern Cross, um, beautiful planets that we can see in the morning at the moment, such as uh, Jupiter, Mars, and um, Saturn as well. So that is gonna be a lot of fun. And we're gonna look at full moon and figure out lots of stuff about the moon, like where it came from and what it's gonna be like to go back there. Um, because astronauts of your generation are going to be going and living on the moon, which is very, very exciting. So you do need to register for the next session, just like you did for this one. Um, so the link will be underneath um, this live stream um, right here on the. Um, so after I end this stream, just go straight down there and register for the next session. You'll get the, the new link um, for that session. Um, and if you want to find some fantastic free colouring sheets um, from the book Under the Stars, um, the illustrators very kindly created some free colouring sheets. All you have to do is go to lisaharveysmith.com um, and you can download those free colouring sheets. That's a lot of fun and maybe you can send those to me on social media um, and I can <laughs> look at your fantastic creations. Um, so go to the website, check out um, the colouring sheets and also um, you can register for the next session. I'm so sorry I do have to go now. Um, I'm going to end the stream, um, but it's been great fun. Um, chat, keep chatting on social media as well, Lisa Harvey Smith um, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and also Instagram for cool young things. Um, it's been great fun, um, and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Goodbye.